وقل رب زدني علما Yeah, sorry, you were saying that you're harmonizing between the two. Yeah, um, so in terms of how to harmonize, they all forsook him and fled. And John being there as a witness to the crucifixion, as suggested in John's Gospel. Um, when did they forsake him and fled? They forsook him and fled when he was arrested on the Mount of Olives in the yes. Garden of Gethsemane. Chronologically, that takes place a long time before the crucifixion. To harmonize the two, it is very plausible that John did indeed flee, but came back for the crucifixion. Quite simple. Right, that's speculation again. Well, no, 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 that's, yeah. no, no, because it's not speculation in terms of we don't know this happened, but it could have happened. This is speculative. This is a, a harmonization based upon what we are told by different texts. You see, you're saying we have no historical okay, by John saying he was there. Yeah. Right, okay. Because on the one hand, your account, we've got no historical evidence that took place, but it could have. Whereas I'm saying we have two historical records that these things took place, we can be harmonized. Okay. That's the big difference between the two. That's why I say yours is far more speculative than mine. Uh, okay, no problem. But then, if Jesus was to die and resurrect, and as you said, there's many verses I point to, familiar with some of them, then, and you said there were so many eyewitnesses after his resurrection, why did the, the disciples get scared of when they, when they saw him? Yeah, but... uh, one is that they thought he was a ghost. The second is actually the fact that they were scared when they saw him makes even more sense if he had been crucified than if he hadn't. If he hadn't been crucified, they would have said, oh look, it's our mate Jesus who escaped death. It's the fact that he died, which meant they were so surprised to see him and thought they were seeing a ghost. Okay. But if I said to you, for example, I'm going to... Okay, die. so we're now moving on to the passion predictions, which is a good No, question. no, no, this is the uh, same point. Okay. If I said to you... Let, sorry, I'm, I don't equate myself to Jesus, okay. no, no, no way. But let's say, Jesus said to them in the, in the Gospels that you shall see the Son of Man crucified, died, and resurrected again. So if that happened, he was taken away, and they heard that he was crucified, and he came back, why would they be scared? Okay, good question. And I'll, I'll accept that as a good point. My responses would probably be twofold. From a supernatural perspective, we are told that in Luke's Gospel, um, they... Had to, I forget the exact terminology, but the two disciples were walking to the mouths. They had to have their hearts open, they had to have their eyes open to understand what was going on, the fact that he'd been resurrected, the fact that the scriptures pointed to him. Essentially, there was kind of a hardness of heart there going on. Um, so it's, as a theist, I can simply say God either cast or the devil cast or there was cast over the hardness of heart such that they could not understand the price of the death. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just let me finish that. Um, that's what Luke's gospel is going to indicate. Um, from a naturalistic point of view, Craig Evans has done a very good argument. I forget the title, we can look it up. Um, look at, and he was defending how Jesus could have said these, yet Confucius could have still arose. And he was looking at how you know the wording Jesus used could have um, brought in mind ambiguity, they could have been thinking of the, the final resurrection rather than a, a soon resurrection. All sorts of human explanations why the confusion may have still persisted. Um, combined with that, all the psychological, you know, the shock of losing your beloved leader, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it is a good challenge, but I think there are good responses too. Because if you remember, that's Luke chapter 24, as far as I remember. When Jesus went to the upper room, it says they were frightened, or they thought they saw a ghost. ghost. Right. But then if you look at it, Jesus already told them that the resurrected body is resurrected in spirit. The resurrected body was resurrected in spirit. Yeah. Spiritualized. So when when somebody dies. What are you? So what I'm saying. So I think there has been, unless I'm mistaken, I think there has been a New Testament shift in terms of. Sorry, New Testament study shift in terms of how the New Testament portrays the spiritual resurrection, such that it's not necessarily to be understood as a ghost or something. But the point is not physical. Being, that's my point. It's not. Well, no, no. As in, I think, it's, I think scholarship has to some extent been quite like John Dominic Russell to understanding spiritual as being, you know, um, perfected, holy, etc. It's not about being physical or not. Okay. So I think one might argue you're using out-of-date scholarship, and also perhaps misinterpreting it. I mean, is, is it Luke? 
I mean, I, the, the impression I get of all the Gospels is that the resurrection, there is an element which is, you know, you might say it's ghostly, you know, he appears, he suddenly disappears, but the Gospel authors also take pains to point out, you know, um, he'll eat food, you know, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see me have, yeah. uh, or flesh and blood as you see me have, whatever. Um, so I think the same, that the Gospels you're appealing to make quite clear is a physical resurrection. No, you mis- misunderstood my Maybe. point. Sorry, okay. I, I don't mean like a ghost and ghoul. Okay. What I mean by that is Jesus, when he was asked, he was asked, he, was, he was said there was a woman, she married this man who had seven brothers. Okay. And they died one by one. Yeah. One by one they died. Who shall inherit? Obviously they had a custom that the brother should inherit the wife yeah. if his brother dies. Yeah. So they all inherited that one by one. But the question they posed Jesus was, in the uh, hereafter, whose wife will she be? Who, who shall be there? Yeah, who, who shall yes. be? He says that uh, no one will die anymore. There will be no death. So everybody will be spiritualized. Okay. I don't remember that. And what I remember from that passage in terms of what it's trying to teach us is she will not be anyone's wife because there will be no marriage. Uh, no, it will be as the angel in heaven. Um, so that's a bit I remember. So they said neither will they die because they will be spiritualized. So that means there's no physical existence. Yeah, well, you say because they'll be... I mean, they'll be as the angels in heaven. That's it. Um, so that's spirit. That's what, angels what, angels what, so I don't think the term spirit is that... I think the point of the passage is they will be like the angels. In that, they will not be married. That's not necessarily saying we'll be of the same substance as angels. I think right. that's perhaps... Mis- I'm sorry, where in Luke? Or where in... I don't remember to search it there. I can't remember exactly where. Uh, Luke 20. And Matthew, but we'll go to Luke. Ah, Luke 20. So Jesus says in response, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Oh yeah, you're right. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. Okay, so we learn here they're like angels, so I guess, you know, in not... Well, hold on, they're like angels in not dying, in not being married. It doesn't necessarily mean in terms of being spirit, though. Maybe the other verse is uh, spiritualized. Okay. Neither shall die again, they're spiritualized. I mean, you have proved me to uh, wrong twice already, so you may, you may be right. But it's very important to see everything he says. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are, so Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said? Um, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of, God of Jacob. So that's the end of that discussion. So I, there's nothing here about being Right, so maybe it's a different version, King James version. Ah, well, I can't defend the, the translation of King James version. So what I'm saying is, it can't be as far away from what you just read. So he means like they'll be like angels. So I, what I understand that they're not have physical bodies. Okay, I would say that is an unnecessary conjecture. Because the passage itself, <laughs> the passage itself is talking about the fact they won't be married right. and that they won't die. Is so, the body immortal? Physical body. The resurrected body, yes. Right. So in, in New Testament theology, for example, Jesus, who is the prototype of all humans in terms of the resurrection, um, he was raised, it was physical, according to the gospel accounts, yet we're told you know, he'll never die again. So yes, the resurrection body is physical, yes it is. But what I'm saying is that... <laughs> It is ordained, it is ordained unto all men to die once, then the resurrection. Okay. It's ordained for everybody to die once, and then resurrection. Okay. So if Jesus had died before he went to upper room, that would have been his resurrected body, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, and as Christians we believe that Jesus is still in his glorified resurrection body. Right. So if he is in his glorified body, when he said to them that do not see it's me, yeah. handle me and see yeah. for a resurrected body, 
does not have flesh and bones like you see me have. I think he says for a ghost or something. Can I have a look? For a spirit, it does not have. Ah, well, spirit. he's not. A, okay, hold on. For a spirit, it does not have a yeah. flesh and bones. I think, like I think my, my ghost, maybe I'm using King James now, is translating your spirit. Um, Luke 24. Thank you. Uh, so 24, sorry, Luke 24, verse 39. Look at my hands and my feet, see that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So this has ghost, the Greek. Or that I said this was 39. Yeah, spirit, new. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what I'm saying. So he's not a, he's not a spirit, but he's a resurrected body. What's, what's the problem? So this is what I'm saying to you. Okay. The resurrected body is flesh and bones that people can touch. Uh, well, yes, it is flesh and bones people can touch. Yeah. So why would you ask them to touch him and see? What is it? To see that he's not a spirit, <coughs> not a ghost. So now, <coughs> the verse that says he's all pain, he's all mouth, yeah. he die once and then resurrection. And we know from yeah, the, he has been resurrected, yes. We know from the other verse okay. that he was, it is so physical and it's, it is raised, raised spiritual. Paul says that. Yeah. So the body is so physical and raised spiritual. Okay, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about New Testament studies on Paul. So you need to harmonize all these verses to Well, yeah, that's, that's what biblical theology does, that's what Quranic theology does. Um, again, I think New Testament studies has moved away from saying that Paul envisages a, a purely, you know, just a spirit being raised, into saying Paul envisages a physical resurrection, but that it is spiritual. That is, it is immortal, it is, it is without sin, etc. It is holy. Um, so I think that's what Paul is talking about in, in Do you see my point, what I'm, I'm coming to? If there's a verse that says, it is so physical, it is spiritual, and Jesus says, now well, hold, Okay, let's, yeah. let me just see what one says. So far I'm not seeing the contradiction, but maybe it'll, uh, maybe the penny will drop. John's the savior of John will save him today. You <laughs> are going to be a Okay, let's see. <laughs> Alright, Muhammad. Alright. Okay. Alright. 42. So it is with the resurrection. So sorry, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, yeah. verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a physical body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, etc., etc., etc. So it's not saying it is raised a new a spirit, it is saying it is spiritual. So it is raised a soma pneumatical, a spiritual body. Now there is a difference. So I mean, one is an adjectival form, especially because it's applied to soma, particularly in something physical. So spiritual body and spirit are not necessarily the same thing. Both because one is, as I said, is adjectival, applied to a general physical noun. The other is purely a noun. Also, these are different authors. Different authors do use language differently. That's a good point. Can I agree with the previous one? You said so, I, I will confess, I will, I will confess up authors. right that I, you know, I don't know much about what people are doing. I generally don't know much about what people are doing. James White had this debate with John Dominic Crossan, etc. Because uh, John Dominic Crossan, for example, very skeptical scholar, he used to believe that was talking just about a spiritual motivation, just a spirit. But I think he changed his mind in line with a wider shift in New Testament studies to say that spiritual doesn't mean immaterial, unphysical, it's talking about holiness. But I just have to look into that more. I don't know much about Paul, like um, pneumatology and studying the resurrection. What I looked at before, Jesus is telling me that I have disciples. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, and I'm using my own scripts here. Yeah, yeah. But this is just what he's saying. Who are you scared of me? Why, why is this a reaction? Come and see. You think I'm a ghost? Come on, hand up and see. And to prove further, he says, if you 
done anything here to eat. But if you're yeah. if you're going to use Luke 24 for that purpose, you've yeah. also got to look at the same words of Jesus in Luke 24 that the scriptures taught the Messiah had to die. So uh, if you're just going to use one bit of Jesus' words and ignore the other, I'd say it's kind of unfair. It's a bad reading of Luke's gospel, and it's a bad reading of the whole thing and history. First of all, when we started, you made your position clear. Okay. You said you believe in the writers of the gospels. Now, I, let, let me let clarify. Me this point, sorry. No, because I think you misunderstood what I meant. No, you said that since you say you, take, you accept what they wrote, yes. that's your basis for arguments. This is understandable. Okay. I'm not in that same position. So now, the, the reason I pick verses from here and there, ah. because, because one, I don't believe in the whole Bible. For example, the verse you said that Luke says, yeah, yeah. Jesus said he's, you know, he's called God or whatever, I will not accept them. Okay. Because as a Muslim. But there are verses in the Bible I do accept. Jesus righteous man, the virgin. I wholly concur with that, those, yeah, because that matches. Me. But what I'm saying, the Luke, the verses that show that Jesus is merely human, you cannot ignore them for the, uh, at the, at the cost of the other ones. So I think there's a broader question here, which is about how Muslims use the Bible. And it's actually really important to talk about. Um, I accept that you don't believe in the Bible in the way that I do. Um, and it's acceptable, therefore, for you to kind of chop it up in a set. What I would say is... Unfair comment. What, what, what I would say is, from my perspective, to, to try and make an argument about the historical Jesus, through which, and that's why you're using Luke not as scripture, but as a historical source here, to reflect on the actual Jesus. If that same source refutes the interpretation you're trying to make, I'm not saying that's bad theology, you're not believing the Bible, it's it's bad history. Okay, because it means you are discrediting the very source you're trying to lean upon. If you're trying to say that the theology or, or the historical record of Luke is inconsistent, that's a better argument. It's not. No, I, the first you're not trying to make that. I, I think it's a really weak argument. It's, it's like me saying, "Hey, look, um, I believe the Titanic sank." Yeah, I've got this amazing historical record written in 1910. Oh, by the way, half of the article absolutely rubbish. The other half is good. No, right. Okay. That's a fair comment. Yeah. If I say, if somebody says to me, Titanic sank, and they make a big story about it. Okay. The fact that Titanic sank is compared by other people. Other people said the same thing. That's I'll fine. take that. That's fine. So for example, in, the, in Luke, when Jesus says, handle me and see it on that spiritual body, there are verses that I showed you that yeah. says it's on in physical. It matches those. That's why I've taken that. Okay. Whereas there are other things yeah. that Luke says, yeah. he says them uniquely himself. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's fair enough to try and read. See, right, if, if it, you can find a consistent strain throughout all of the sources, then, then I start to give it some attention. But I think because in all those sources, it is, it is very easy to harmonize it with the, the broader New Testament narrative and what seems to be the overall impression of the gospel. That's why I don't give it much weight. If, if it was really jarring with what Luke in general was trying to say, then I'd give it a lot more support. But I don't think it is. Do you think they were all inspired by God? So, when they wrote, they were helped by the Holy Spirit. Now, what I and many other evangelicals believe is not dictation, so they use their own personalities, they were guided. influenced by their circumstances, but that God influenced those scriptures. There, there are perhaps different ways it could be understood. Either maybe, you know, they felt moved to write, maybe God simply was sovereign over the circumstances leading to them to write that, you know. Uh, but actually, no, I'd, I'd probably take that stronger model. I mean, one Timothy talks about, you know, being God-breathed. So I'd want to say there's some kind of active inspiration there, more than just sovereignty. Um, so yeah, I think God moves them. Actually, I mean, is it Second Peter or First Peter that talks about them being moved along by the Holy Spirit? But let me ask you just quickly. Yeah. If you say that they're all inspired by God, they were moved by the Spirit to write How do you explain Luke? Um, what's that? I brought you to your ex. When you were saying that because he saw everybody writing, then as a physician, he still thought to himself, what's the problem? Why shouldn't I write? Because I'm saying, even if God moves, he's had to move to the other side. Yeah. 
I'll say as as I find it, even though God's spirit, you know, moves people, inspires, we also, as I said, we do believe that there is human initiative, there is human perspective, there is human speech, etc. So the fact that Luke was motivated, he, he was prompted by human forces, is simply not a problem in our model of inspiration. Luke one one. Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, uh, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you in my section. So the inspiration of God is not apparent in that verse, but neither does that verse deny it. To find the inspiration. No, because as we say, we believe both that there is if, if my doctrine, if the evangelical doctrine is, there is both human initiative and there is divine inspiration. How does that verse challenge our doctrine scripture one bit? Okay, because when I ask whether well, they inspired by God to write, and you say yes, then and he says, I'm sorry everybody writing, I'm sorry I write I write again. Uh, I write as well. So the conflict is that he's not let, let me put it this way, let me put it this way. He's not uh, uh, what's the word uh, proving your point is that it's inspired. Let me put this way. Okay. Let's just in, I'm not saying this is how it happened, but could it be this way? Luke is standing there. Oh, everyone purely human at the moment. Yeah. Oh, everyone's writing. I'm going to write too. I start writing, thinking, what shall I say? Oh, there's something within me that is drawn to writing that verse. That seems appropriate. That seems fitting. I'm going to write that verse. Does not that model both harmonise the human aspect, the human thought, the human input, while recognising the divine inspiration and carrying it along? Why is that not going right. to happen? What that tells me is that he saw everybody, I'll take his word at face value, okay. he saw everybody writing, and some a, a learned person, I have science behind me, I'm a physician. Why shouldn't I write? That's what he's saying. Obviously, it doesn't negate the point, the fact that maybe when he started writing, he was inspired. It doesn't take that away. But that's a conjecture at this point. So if we ignore Luke then, okay. so I think we hammer that. Which other author says they are inspired by God? Says they are. Uh, I, I'm not sure many of them. So I mean, in kind of the Old Testament prophets, you'll get some prophets who will explicitly say this is the word of the Lord. So at least part of their writings is an explicit claim to, to part of a divine word. Um, but generally, we don't believe a book is divine because the author claims to be divine. And in the New Testament, I should add, you know, Paul talked about, you know, having the Spirit of God, having the authority that comes with that. He says his revelation was neither given to me nor was I taught. I'm talking about the gospel message that came to him by revelation of Christ. He says it was neither revealed to me nor was I taught. I'm going to have to look up that verse. That's what it says. So when he says that, why is I ignored at the uh, okay. price of. Let's have a look at that verse. I can't remember the exact reference, yeah. but you may have to search it. Is it this one? Um, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from the human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it from the revelation of Jesus Christ. No. So we're thinking, yes. So what's the issue? What's the issue is, see, from, from somebody who's not evangelical, who's not a Christian, he claims to have seen Jesus. Okay. He was neither taught it, he says, by any human. Okay. He, got it, he got it directly from his vision. Okay, that's fine. How's that fine? Because I mean, we, we believe that that vision is true. We believe he was then authenticated by the other apostles. I think we're, we're probably moving into a different area here. Um, no, this is, we're moving at inspira inspiration in the writing the gospel. Wait, well, it, it, I, I feel like because I was talking about kind of Paul claims kind of the spirit of God and the authority that comes with that. I think you might be challenging whether or not that's a true claim, but I feel that's a side issue to whether the claim is made, which was the initial point you said, which is do these documents make that claim? So I'd like I'd like to stick to that that bit. Do they make do, that claim? The so I think some accept it. In the heart of the they accept him. Yes, I mean I I do find good evidence for that. I mean you know the Book of Acts, for example. You know, portrays them as, as um, you know, being on a common mission. Galatians, I think it is, talks about receiving the right hand of fellowship. Second Peter, of course. Uh, um, second Peter, you know, approves Paul in his writings, um, and then just generally, 
the consistent you know, message we find throughout the scriptures, and then just say, and then you know, the early Christian writers to whether that you know maybe be Clement, I don't know, Ignatius, Polycarp, the these guys who talk about the same breath. So all of kind of the sorry, the Book of Acts is attributed to Luke, who was a disciple of Paul. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So you could say that Luke had a bias. That's fine. Um, you could say that all of these authors had a bias, and that's probably true. But what I would also say is the general consistent message of all the historical sorts of kind of, you know, Luke and Acts, Paul himself, um, the general consistent message of all the New Testament authors, um, things like, you know, Polycarp, Clements, Ignatius, when everyone is saying that they agree, even when sometimes, you know, they'll admit their attention, you know, look at Galatians, look at the tension that's portrayed there, even though he still claims to be on the same page with the claims to have fellowship, and often these claims aren't made in a, I'm trying to claim authority, with they're, they're often made on the cuff as well. Um, so all of that to me suggests that to oppose the idea that they're in fundamental agreement is a bit of a conspiracy. You have to, sorry, you have to give good evidence why there's a disagreement. But, so I'll admit it's not watertight, but yes. um, it's all the evidence we have and there's so much of it and it's so consistent. Yeah, it's very important.